Buenas noches. Good evening. Good evening. Right, we're here to talk about uh, flying. There's a song by Pink Floyd called Learning to Fly, and it says, uh, my condition binds me to the earth, but I'm trying to escape it. In Peter Pan, uh, the author says, all children grow up except Peter Pan, and he was the only child who learned to fly. That was what James Matthew Barry said. Sarah, you want to learn to fly, right? Yes, you'd love that. So, now, how much is it determination? And how much is it just a desire not to grow up? Now, I know you're a molecular biologist as well, and, uh, but what is it that prompts you to try and become an astronaut? Well, maybe it was something that uh, I've always felt right from when I was a very young child, and that's curiosity. Curiosity, uh, my desire to explore, to um, follow what excites me and to explore what excites me, something that we perhaps lose when we grow up. Um, I'm quite naive and I haven't lost that naivety, that naive eagerness. Um, I, I, I really enjoy being an astronaut or trying to be an astronaut because every day is different. You're testing yourself every single day. It's very stimulating. And uh, this is why I want to be an astronaut. Now, is there a something about science that has to do with uh, trying to discover the secret of different mysteries? We've just heard that with the magnificent uh, last keynote lecture. What are the mysteries that you want to explore? Oh, all sorts of mysteries. For the last 12 years, I've been focusing on cancer research. It's a field that uh, attracted me for a couple of reasons. One, because it's a very complex field. It's a type of... Uh, uh, it's, it, it's a very complex disease. Uh, Professor Kaloth talked about, you know, how biologists see life, and it's true, it's incredibly complicated. Uh, also, I was attracted to this field because I think it can have a huge social impact, uh, and that was what uh, really motivated me. And uh, I think space research uh, is similar. Uh, it's trying to discover the secrets of the same mysteries. Now, you're a molecular biologist. You're working in one of the best research centers in Spain. And then you decided to sort of change track and uh, start to focus on space exploration. Uh, how do you get there? I mean, what do you have to do to become an astronaut in the European Space Agency, of course, we're talking about? Well, I think the most difficult thing about trying to join the European Astronaut Corps is there needs to be an opportunity for you to do it because it doesn't happen very often because we don't have very much capacity for manned uh, journeys into space. They don't need to renew their astronaut corps so often as they do in NASA. NASA opens up calls for astronauts almost every year, but the European Space Agency only does it every 13, 15 years. So there's only been four calls so far, and in each one, between four and six astronauts are recruited. Uh, which, which means that, you know, no matter how, how badly you want it, and no, and no matter how well you're prepared, you might not even get the opportunity to try and enter the core because they simply don't need astronauts during your lifetime. So there has to be an opportunity. There has to be sort of, you know, a job going, to put it in simple terms. And then you have to meet a number of requisites. They're quite simple. You have to be a scientist of some kind. Uh, there's a wide range of different uh, scientific disciplines that can lead you to become a scientist. You can be a natural scientist, which is my case. I'm a cancer researcher, which has got nothing to do with space exploration, of course. You can study engineering, mathematics, medicine, or the more classical route or pathway, which was sort of test pilots. Okay, so you meet those conditions. Uh, you are a scientist. There's a, a job going. So what type of tests or trials do you have to go through? 
Yes, there are six different uh, assessment phases. I have to say that before I made the decision, uh, and I did this as an adult, I said, look, do I really want this? Am I really going to try to do this? What is motivating me? Because I have a career, a well-established career, and I don't want to be just chasing a childlike dream or fantasy. So I had to sit down and really think about this, and I had to find out what sort of things an astronaut would actually do. And I discovered that basically they're just researchers. They do much what I do, much the same as what I do, but in a very extraordinary environment. And that's what prompted me to give it a go. So once the process was opened up, uh, because it, it doesn't happen very often, 23,000 European candidates uh, put their names down and applied for it. So you also need a medical certificate. So this was just to make sure that the people who were applying for the job were taking it seriously and were healthy. First of all, there's a human resources screening to find the best profiles. You have to answer a questionnaire. You have to write a, sort of a motivational letter. And uh, only 1,400 people got through that first phase. So we're talking about uh, 21,000 people who started the process. 1,400 went through the first um, screening. Uh, phase. Yes, 1,400 went through the first screening phase. So, and then we had to do a series of cognitive tests, which had to do with psychomotor skills and intelligence tests, etc. Uh, we did that at the headquarters of the agency in Hamburg in Germany. Uh, all sorts of different exams as well. Mathematics, physics, English, memory tests, concentration tests, spatial orientation tests. The key really wasn't, uh, you know, to be have a photographic memory or a deep rooted knowledge of physics, for example. The what they were looking for was people who were able to really um, sort themselves out in any difficult situation. And 400 people passed those tests. And the next phase was more subjective. And I would actually say from this moment on, after you'd actually passed these tests, there's a standard uh, score. You either get the score or you don't. And everyone, it's the same as the medical test. But the rest of the process was much more subjective because what they're looking for are certain psychological profiles. And they're looking for very specific characteristics. So uh, they evaluated us and assessed us all sorts of different ways. This... Uh, we had to go to Cologne, to the Astronaut Center. We had interviews with psychologists, with panels of veteran uh, uh, astronauts, group dynamic tests as well. We were given exercises, and I think none of them had any solutions. Uh, and it was so frenetic, everything uh, was so quick that it was really easy to just, you know, lose it or to get really nervous and get really anxious. I'm not going to pass. I'm not going to be able to do it. And, and they sort of put us under pressure. And they, they wanted to see how we reacted, whether we were able to communicate well under pressure, work uh, as part of a team under pressure, and to worry about your colleagues, not just about your own interests. So you're all researchers, right? But you've been put in very specific conditions. And just, you know, just to see how you behave and how you react to those situations. Okay. So what was the most unexpected thing that happened to you in all that process? What did you not expect to find? Well, I didn't have any expectations, to be honest. I had absolutely no idea what was going to happen. But I think the process itself, just getting through that process and, you know, not going completely mad during the process is a test in and of itself, because you're talking about eight months and you don't know what's going to be assessed, when you're going to be assessed, you have to be ready for everything. You can just get a phone call or an email at any moment and in two weeks time you have to go to a different European city and you know take a test that you don't know what the test is going to consist of. So you can't really prepare for the for the test. It's not like an exam where you can you know learn everything off by heart and get really well prepared for it. You can't do that. So uh, preparation is for the, the first round of tests. And after that, it's just they're just assessing you as a person, as an individual, what kind of psychological profile you have and whether you, you're a fit for them. How many of you got through that? 17 people. Uh, five uh, who were astronauts and then 12 uh, reserves, um, including John McFold, 
who was uh, already working there uh, to try to develop the different capacities that you need in space. And there were 11 uh, reservists, and we then uh, are there. And when there's a mission that fits our profile, then we get called up. So we're reserves. So what's the difference between career you and career astronauts? Well, career astronauts go and work at the European Astronaut Centre and they're employed by the space agency uh, from that moment until they retire. Uh, it doesn't matter whether or not they have a mission, they work for the agency and between missions they're doing other sort of things or they're constantly in training, they're carrying out, uh, I don't know, educational tasks, uh, logistical support, operations, etc. But they uh, leave their job and they go and work for the space agency. But the reservists, we keep our jobs, but if there's a mission, then uh, we would be signing a contract or we would establish a specific type of agreement that would set out what training we would need to receive and the mission we would have to carry out. Now, you're bio, uh, a molecular biologist. Uh, what other profiles were selected? I mean, what were they looking for? Well, there's a huge amount of variety. There's an astrophysicist, there's a helicopter pilot, of a career astronaut, Pablo Alvarez is an aeronautic uh, engineer, there's a neurologist, and there's a, a mountain rescue expert as well. And these are the career astronauts. Wow, that's great, just in case we go to a rocky planet, right? We need to have a mountain rescue expert. Well, no, I think they were just uh, looking for different profiles. The more uh, challenging your job, or the more challenging your mission, uh, then the more multidisciplinary your team has to be. You need to be able to solve any problem, which is why uh, they want some uh, physicians, because you can't call an ambulance if you're you know, in the middle of outer space. So uh, you have to just solve the problems with the people who are on your team. If there's a, a loss of scientific data that happens, there needs to be someone with uh, the knowledge required to recover the data or to carry out new experiments uh, without the support of the scientists who are back on Earth. Because in the International Space Station, for example, uh, what they're doing is uh, scientific experiments up in the space station. One single uh, astronaut in a six-month mission, which is the usual duration of a mission, will be carrying out about 300 scientific experiments, fluid mechanics, phys physical uh, experiments, they're growing plants, they're doing all sorts of different things. This is what astronauts do, so they have to have a wide range of different capacities. They have to be able to, you know, set up a solar panel, they have to be able to work with bacteria. So you need to have um, both generic and very specialist knowledge. So I am assuming that you have to continuously train, right? Yes, you train continuously. The uh, project astronauts or the reservists, uh, which is my case, they give us express training. And you're talking about two or three uh, years of working from Monday to Sunday. I mean, basically seven days a week. And you need that for two or three years in order to know everything you need to know. Yeah, so you need a lot of training for a mission, right? You have to know basically everything. Uh, each person has its uh, scientific training and their specialist area, but all astronauts need to be able to operate the uh, spaceships. They need to be able to maintain all the equipment on board. They need to have a good communication with the Earth. They need to carry out scientific experiments. They have to be able to use uh, extra vehicle mm, vehicles. They have to be able to do all sorts of different things. And every single member of the team has to be able to do that, whether or not you're an engineer, biologist, or pilot, or a physician. So you just have to just, you know, go back to school and start studying. It's like going back to school. And I've kind of perceived uh, a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of vibrations from the audience. Um, I know that you have to learn Russian, right? Why do you have to learn Russian? Well, if we have to have an emergency uh, evacuation, we use... Russian protocols and everything's in Russian and uh, in fact uh, we communicate with Earth often in Russian so we need to uh, learn Russian. There was another reason in the past uh, the Russian agency used to actually participate in our training now for obvious reasons they no longer do that but uh, the security protocols mean that we need to learn to speak Russian. 
Now, the scientific side of the missions. Uh, do you share these missions with other space agencies or do they have different types of missions? No, it's the only objective really, uh, especially at the, the International Space Station. Almost 90% of what we do has to do with science and it's shared. The reason that we carry out this type of research in microgravity is because it enables us to study all sorts of different properties that are on, under conditions that are impossible to reproduce on the Earth. I mean, you can reproduce them, but not for a very long time. Uh, you have different centrifuges, uh, which can replicate the absence of gravity, but it's not the same as being up for six months in a zero-gravity laboratory. You can't recreate those conditions here. Working in microgravity, what does it enable you to do? It enables you to try out new materials. Uh, you don't have aggregation or sedimentation. That means that all the different mixes that are produced are very pure. This enables us to create new alloys, new crystalline uh, compounds, for example, uh, there's a drug that's being developed to treat cancer. And these drugs, or well, different drugs, now these drugs which are very good in targeted uh, therapies don't dissolve in water very well. So patients have to go to hospital and they have to uh, have an intravenous treatment for hours in a clinic. But if we could change the formula, then we would change the administration and they could just inject themselves at home and then they would be treated. But only, these things can only be achieved in zero gravity where you can control all the conditions. And what's the influence uh, between? And what is the connection between space missions and Earth missions? Is there communication? Um, do you uh, share information? Well, of course we do. There's different types of calls for different missions because obviously the missions in the, run by the European space stations, the resources are limited and everybody wants to use the labs. So you have to really decide what projects are going to be carried out uh, at the, up in the International Space Station and you have to distribute it. Uh, you have to select the very, very best projects and they're the projects that get carried out on the International Space Station and then the astronauts carry them out. This is coordinated uh, and that lots of people are involved. Companies, academia, universities, all of them work together to select the most interesting projects and then they're carried out in a coordinated way. So there is a coordination between the different space agencies, right? Yes, between space agencies, laboratories, uh, astronauts, because we need to optimize the time. And uh, unless we're talking about um, sponsorship by private companies, all the data generated are uh, in the public domain. And then, of course, the health of the astronauts and monitoring the health of astronauts is also a study in and of itself combined with medicine. And it's another one of the requisites is that you have to be willing to sort of be a lab rat. Uh, you're going to be the guinea pig in, in all of these different experiments and you're going to take your own samples because studying how human the human body reacts in, uh, in microgravity is like studying aging, accelerated aging. When a human being is in microgravity and is overexposed to radiation, we lose bone density, that you're more likely to develop cancer, you have problems with cataract, you are more likely to develop cognitive defects. All of these different processes that happen little by little as we age normally on Earth happen very drastically and very quickly during a space mission. And so everything uh, to, that is connected to astronauts' health is, uh, is studied. And there are a lot of countermeasures that are obviously uh, are now being applied on Earth against osteoporosis, etc., thanks to everything that's done in the space station. So you just, you know, you donate your bodies to science while you're still alive, basically. Sara, what type of missions are carried out by the European Space Agency and how often do astronauts go to the International Space Station or go on missions? In other words, uh, what's the waiting list like? How long have you got to wait? Right, let me just try and explain this so that you can all understand. The International Space Station is used by all the different international uh, space agencies on the planet and it has... Um, uh, it's overextending its uh, useful life. I mean, the idea is it's going to be dismantled. It was going to be dismantled, but in fact, we're going to prolong it, that useful life, to 2030. And after that, we'll have private space stations. 
uh, not governed by agencies. And you can then reserve time for experimentation. So from here until 2030, the European Space Agency has agreed to have a, an annual mission per, uh, per astronaut because we have limited resources. Uh, we actually don't have capacity to carry out manned space missions. We have to use NASA's resources. We don't have uh, our own resources to have manned flights up to the space station. So the most important laboratory of the International Space Station is, is called Columbus, was developed by Europe. And this laboratory is being used by the Japanese, the Chinese, the Americans, etc. So, um, in return for time in, this, in the laboratory, we get to, you know, hop on one of the space shuttles that's going up to the International Space Station. So we've got uh, five astronauts that are going to be going up to the space station, one a year until 2030. In our case, the reservist, if there's another specific mission, mission which will probably last for a short amount of time, not six months, then we could use other companies such as Action, for example, who also use NASA rockets to go up to the uh, space station. It's basically a public-private collaboration and uh, that's what everything depends on. So the level of coordination is very, very high, right? Um, with the other agencies, because just not long ago, we heard about the Indian space station. Um, what sort of relationship do you have with India and China and other space stations like that? Not such a close relationship as a relationship we have with NASA or JAXA, for example, because those are the two um, space agencies, the American one and the Canadian one, which, which we have the closest relationship. But we do have uh, the Chinese and the Indian space agencies, and they are really going from strength to strength. So I expect in the future we will be collaborating with them more closely, but we don't have uh, too much collaboration at the moment. After this entire process, astronauts, well, for those of you who uh, work in the world of science and technology, your astronauts, uh, we, we tend to associate you with the heroic side of science, right? Astronauts, much more than scientists and technologists. So how do you feel, how, to what extent do you feel that you're a role model? I mean, do you feel that you're fairly well, a lot exposed to public opinion? This isn't something that I've ever really thought about. Um, it's, I feel very uh, flattered when people tell me that I've uh, become a role model. But... Uh, I think it's a heavy responsibility. Um, I want to live up to expectations. I think it's really important for future generations to have role models, examples, that tell them that, in fact, you can do these things that seem so extraordinary. Um, and they are extraordinary because there are very few people who are astronauts. So I think it's good, it's very positive for them to see real uh, examples, people who are real, flesh and blood people who actually did achieve that dream, because for many of them it is a dream. Uh, it really helped me when I was studying my degree, getting to know real people, people with whom I could have a conversation and who'd done fantastic, amazing things, and I could see that they were real people. Uh, and people around me, when I saw them do these amazing things, that was when I thought, well, I probably can do that too, and I wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't have those role models. How long ago uh, was it uh, since you sent in your application? It was June 2021. And in those two and a half years, how have you changed? What have you learned? Oh, I've learned a lot about myself. I've learned that there's no one route to achieve your goals. And when you learn, the more you learn, the more you dare to explore that which fascinates you and excites you, and the better you know your environment, uh, that you, you can end up doing something that you never thought possible. I didn't do everything I did in order to become an astronaut, but every step along the way, every step that I took, uh, since I, I, I was a child looking at the stars with my parents, um, and then I became a researcher, designing protocols, etc. All of these steps 
gave me the tools that I need, I needed to achieve what I've achieved today. So it's important to just learn. Knowledge in and of itself is intrinsically positive and useful. And to quote our first and wonderful speaker, there are many applications that still need to be discovered. Sarah, thank you very much. It's been absolutely fantastic chatting with you this evening. A warm round of applause for this fantastic woman who has learned to fly. Thank you.